You fool! Warren is dead. The Halloween Experiment by Ian Gordon Testing, testing. Hmm. Overseer's Log, October 25th, 1976. This is Dr. Stefan Helm, beginning series of logs concerning Project Delusion. Participants A through E established in isolation cells sequentially. Uh, participant A, the ribald Mr. Finkel, is in the red room, awaiting further instructions. Finkel suffers from a number of ailments, the foremost of which is a common sleep disorder. This has resulted in a barbiturate dependency, which, the subject claims, has given rise to a rather unsettling delusion. Mr. Finkel, can you hear my voice? Yeah, I can. Describe your surroundings, please. Red. All red. The walls, the ceiling, the floor. Christ, the carpet. It's almost identical. How did you know? Now, now, Mr. Finkel. We have to weed this thing out of you, remember? It's like a pesky worm. A tiny, burrowing insect that has found its way into your body, just under the skin riding beneath the surface. Uh, we must uh, peel back the flesh, extract the beast, correct? I suppose so. But I have to say, I'm not a fan of the way you're putting it, Doctor. <laughs> Just focus on your surroundings, Mr. Finkel. Let us not dwell on the beast for the moment. How about you tell your story? Okay. Where shall I begin? As we discussed, with your addiction. The birth of your delusion. Let's hear it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've had it rough these last few years. Work's been hard to come by. So, for about nine months now, I've been living off a fortnightly government handout. It's a pittance, but better than nothing. I live in a bed sit on the outskirts of the city. It's a grubby place with inefficient electric heating and shared bathrooms. Spend most of my time there with a blanket wrapped around my shoulders. Freezing in summer too. My room's north facing, you see. Uh, please refrain from disclosing irrelevant details, Mr Finkel. Fine. Just setting the scene a bit. Well, I've had trouble sleeping too. For the last three months I've been on a prescription drug. Sleeping pill, basically, to help me get off at night. Trouble is, I can't sleep without it now. And the effects of being on it for so long have spilled over into my waking hours. I... I lose concentration easily. Distracted by the slightest thing. Yeah, so... Just last week, I was chopping an onion in front of the telly. It was corned beef ash night. The highlight of my week, actually. I tend to prep food in front of the telly due to the fact that there's little to no counter space in the kitchen area. No room for a dining table either. Anyway, I was sat there, half chopping, half watching whatever banal crap was on the telly, when suddenly I felt a, a searing pain shoot through my left index finger. In a moment of lapsed concentration, I cut into my finger with a knife. In the process, I'd managed to upturn the bowl I'd set aside containing the corned beef. Within a matter of seconds, the majority of it was on the carpet. My hands, gushing finger and all, automatically set about scooping it back up, oblivious of how much worse I was making the situation. Yeah. When I finally realised what I was doing, there remained a small lump of corned beef on the carpet, topped with fresh blood. I must say that I hate that carpet. I hate the ugly floral motif. The dark areas stained by the reckless habits of former occupants. But most of all, I hate the colour. That 
overbearing shade of red. But beggars can't be choosers. God, how are you able to match it so closely in here? Please, try not to get distracted, Mr. Finkel. Okay, okay. Well... In a sort of daze, I, I scraped the last bit of corned beef up and went to the kitchenette to tend to my wounded finger. It was a fairly deep cut, but treatable at home, I felt. I smeared some antiseptic cream over it, popped a plaster on top, and returned to the couch in front of the telly. The old thing was depressing, to be honest. I'd diced myself open and ruined my tea. Well aware that my only backup option food-wise was a tin of beans. It was strange, though. I found myself transfixed by that fresh blood stain on the carpet. It held my attention for some reason. I couldn't shake the image of that toppled corned beef from my mind, all clumpy and gleaming with blood. I felt sick, in fact. And I suppose that's it. The birth of the delusion. Later that night, starving because I'd skipped the beans, I popped a couple of sleeping pills and crawled onto my put-up bed just a few feet away from bloodstain. The bed sits a single room and not at all ruin me at that. There's just no getting away from that carpet. It's not a quiet space either. Including my place, there are five occupied rooms in the building. You can hear the comings and goings of people all night long. All sorts live in there. Drug dealers, burglars, the lonely and the desperate. Shrieks, thuds and heavy footsteps are almost Continuous on all sides. And there's a death every three months. It's not unusual for the poor buggers to lie undiscovered for weeks. You can imagine what it's like for me. I often ponder a macabre notion. Am I sharing a roof with a corpse tonight? But lying there last week, my eyes glued to the blood stain on the carpet, there were no sounds to hear. It was silent throughout, which in itself did little to ease my wandering mind. Where was everybody? Why couldn't I hear them? Eventually, the sleeping pills did their job and I fell into a deep slumber, dreaming of clumpy chunks of blood-soaked corned beef. The following morning, I felt like shit. I was hungry and thirsty, but lacked the motivation to do anything about it. I slumped in front of the telly in an effort to distract myself from the stain at my feet. Oh, God. I managed some beans in the afternoon, but other than that, I remained on the couch in a sort of stupor till late that evening. It must have been after eight o'clock when, returning from one of my many dreaded visits to the shared facilities, I noticed something odd on the carpet. Something unusual right where the blood stain was. It was a little lump, kind of like the corned beef chunk I'd been transfixed by the day before, the thing that haunted my dreams. But it was smooth and red, with the appearance of sunburned skin. I grabbed a spatula from the kitchenette and neared the thing cautiously. Was it pulsating ever so slightly? Surely not. I prodded it with the spatula and, to my aura, realised that the thing was rooted to the carpet. God, what can I compare it to? Well, well, just like a, a big lump on someone's head after being hit with something firm and heavy. Have I heard it called a goose egg? It was rock solid too. And on closer inspection I saw that it was pulsating. With every prod, I noticed small, vein-like lines shoot across the top of it, almost as though it was... clenching. Well, what to do about it? This little alien growth on the carpet? I figured I'd lost the plot, so I grabbed a tea towel and covered the thing with it. Yeah, I pulled the couch over the top of it and just sat down, bewildered. I mean... It couldn't really be there, could it? (laughs) I was just hallucinating. Too many sleeping pills, anxiety, depression, stress. You name it. 
with, with pills on the brain, I, I popped another two and lay back on the couch, praying for sleep to come take me away. Take me away. It was after midnight when I came to. The bedsit was dead again. The night owls were either out partying or deceased, by my reckoning. But it wasn't completely silent, uh, at least not in my immediate surroundings. I heard a sort of scraping sound from somewhere beneath me, kind of like the scuttling of a mouse, a scratching noise that seemed to be coming from the back of the couch. I didn't dare move. I was paralysed. Fear. That's all I felt. Fear. An overwhelming dread washed over me. Never felt anything like it in my life. The scratching noise ceased and was followed by a series of scurrying sounds. As something, probably a mouse, I silently prayed, made its way out of the couch through the back of it. I pulled my knees up to my chin and closed my eyes. I, I was trying to focus, working against the sedatives coursing through my being. But I couldn't focus, couldn't rid myself of that horrible image, that cyst-like lump that had throbbed and pulsated, born of the numerous horrors spilled onto the threadbare carpet over the years. I could have dwelled on its nature, dwelled on how such a thing could have come into existence, but I refused. Refused to think about it. But then that monstrous scuttling invaded my senses again and my eyes shot open, coming face to face with the thing as... With the speed of a cockroach, it crawled up my leg and hurled itself towards my face. Oh, oh. Can you describe the creature, Mr. Finkel? It was just a small lump of red flesh. It moved like a snake moves. No feet, legs, arms, nothing like that. Just clumpy and glistening like the spilled corned beef. No eyes, nose or ears, but a gaping mouth belonging to a veiny protuberance. Its head, its horrible sunburned head. I slid off the couch, narrowly avoiding its snapping maw as it flew towards me and took off running. I ran out into the street yelling, and on I went running and yelling till the police finally intercepted me down by the canal. Made quite the scene, I'm told. Spent three hours in the cells before being brought here, Mr. Elm. I've calmed down since then, of course, but... I know it's out there. And how exactly do you know that, Mr. Finkel? Well, I felt it closing in on me at the police station. Consents it in this room. Well, why did you have to put me in here, Mr. Elm? I, I don't like it. I, I really don't like it. We must yeah. face our fears to overcome them, Mr. Finkel. Face them and move on. But, but, but what if I'm not ready to face the... Fa... What? What? Mr. Finkel? No! Oh! No! Oh! How? Mr. Finkel, what is it? It's found me. It's found me. It's found me. I must terminate this recording. Ah. Mr. Finkel has succumbed to his delusion. That is to say, he's dead. Experiment will continue tomorrow with a participant B. Overseer's Lock, October 26th, 1976. Dr. Stefan Helm speaking. 
I will refrain from providing a detailed analysis of yesterday's events for the time being. Must press on. Project Delusion continues with Participant B, the placid Miss Hennessy. Hennessy is haunted by a specter of sorts, a being best described by the lady herself. She has been placed in the blue room, the color again being a trigger. My initial inclination was to place her in the black room. However, such an environment would only serve to hinder the participant's ability to relate her account. The telling of her story is, as it is in all cases, necessary in terms of drawing a line between delusion and reality. So if the results of experiment A are anything to go by, my process may yet require modification. Lights on. Miss Hennessy, can you hear me? Yes, Doctor. Clearly. Describe for me, if you will, your surroundings. Carmen, sky blue. If I close my eyes, I can almost hear the ocean. Interesting. Uh, calm enough to tell your story? I believe so, Doctor. In your own time. I'm a photographer by trade. Clients range from would-be models to small business owners. I did some high-profile corporate stuff in the late 60s, but I much prefer to keep ventures relatively low-key these days. The whole thing began with a particular photo shoot in the centre of town, a shoot involving the owner and staff of the Ramplin Aquarium on Market Street. I took a good dozen or so snaps of the girls, then moved on to Janet Ramplin herself. I didn't notice anything especially unusual at the time, but I do remember feeling that something was off about that last photograph I took of Janet. Anyway, cut to several days later, and I'm sitting in my dark room developing film. I'd captured a couple of decent photos of the girls, and one excellent photo of Janet, but it was in the development of this final image that I noticed the oddity I'd been only partially aware of at the time. Behind Janet, just inside the store, were situated a number of items arranged in such a way as to suggest, vaguely, an upright figure. A figure that appeared to be peeping at me. After a thorough examination of the picture, I managed to identify its various components. The left leg and foot of the thing belonged to a light blue umbrella. The torso above was nothing more than a navy backpack suspended from the inner wall. A limp and insubstantial arm was a sad-looking scarf, and the head was a pumpkin-shaped fishbowl positioned on the shop counter. I know it's difficult to get an idea of the thing from such a description, but these were the basic elements casually assembled to form the appearance of a tall man in a blue suit with a fish bowl for a head. Even the fish in the bowl, two common goldfish, gave the impression of a pair of golden eyes staring back at me. I might go as far as to say that there was an expression on that watery face, one of disapproval, almost as though I'd uncovered a living secret that wished to remain hidden. I'm sorry to say that the photograph no longer exists, but taking what followed into account, I hope you'll appreciate why I took the decision to destroy it, and the others. Please continue. <laughs> the image of the fishbowl man haunted me through the rest of the day, and late into the night. So, the following morning, I returned to the Ramplin Aquarium, and, without knowing exactly why, I bought the two goldfish, and a square tank to take them home in. I figured, on some level or other, that buying the fish would nullify the power of the weird photograph, that I was, in effect, dismantling the figure, unmaking it, undoing its ability to play on my mind. I'm sure Janet thought I was acting a little strange. Perhaps it had something to do with the fact that I kept glaring at the blue umbrella by the door, 
and that sad looking scarf. The first thing I did when I got home was place the fish tank on my dining table in the living room. I fed the little blighters and snuck off to the dark room to catch up on some work. I hadn't so much as glanced at that creepy photo of Janet Ramplin since buying the goldfish. I was afraid to look, to tell you the truth. I could still see that strange fishbowl man in the back of my mind, and that was where I wanted him to stay for the time being. But for some reason or other, on my way out of the dark room, I grabbed the photograph and took it with me into the living room. With a glass of sherry in one hand, I flipped the photograph over, and lo and behold, there he was, the odd fellow in the blue suit. But here's where things start to get really weird. Although Fishball Man was still standing there, all erect and sinister, his golden eyes were missing. The fish, Doctor, they were no longer in the photograph. I downed the sherry and immediately poured myself another one. I looked again, but those eyes, those fish eyes, were nowhere to be seen. What was happening? Had I accidentally uncovered a hidden world with my camera? A world in which everyday items take on weird and wonderful life when our backs are turned, when our attention is elsewhere? I put my manic thoughts down to the sherry and sat there in a stony silence, watching the goldfish swimming absently back and forth in the square tank. Slowly but surely, Like the intrusion of a slender thorn in my mind, I became overwhelmed by the desire to collect my instant camera and to shoot blindly through the living room window. My apartment's on the second floor of an old mill, with a dreary view of the world outside. But still, I felt the compulsion, so I grabbed the camera in question and rushed to the window, snapping away rapidly targeting the colourless trees in the garden below, the ugly shrubs, the broken fence bordering the derelict tennis courts, the countless identical windows belonging to the building opposite, the shadowy alley in between. Afterwards, I sat at the kitchen table and studied the fresh photographs. Was something speaking to me? Trying to communicate with me through the medium of film? The nine images were grainy, and in the main, out of focus, but in three of them, I appeared to have captured the outline of something disturbingly familiar. A tall, thin figure with a large bowl for a head. At first, it was in the tennis court, silhouetted by the light from a neighbouring street lamp in the alley. Then, in the second shot, It was among the trees in the communal gardens, the directional light from the street lamp reflected from the glass of the bowl. And lastly, in the third photo, it was directly below my window, in the process of extending its arms, but extending them towards what? A window? A door? Or could it... (sighs) It's okay, Miss Hennessy. You're in a safe place. Please, continue. I heard a ghastly sloshing. The sound of a small bowl of water splashing back and forth just below my window. My open window. I heard lots of strange scratching, as if something was climbing up the wall towards my apartment. And then I saw it. My eyes were glued to it. Other than the fishbowl, it wasn't at all how it had appeared in the photograph. The creature came ambling through my window, forcing it all the way open in the process. Its body a navy lump of clay with an outer layer of skin like flaky paint. Its arms and legs little more than clumsy, worm-like strands. It flopped onto the living room floor, sloshing water onto the lino as it did so. I was frozen in place. My jaw was next to my knees. I trembled in its presence. I urinated. Once again, feeling that 
something was amiss. I saw that, just as the case had been in the photograph of Janet Ramplin, the goldfish were missing from the figure's fishbowl head. It crossed the living room in my direction, closing in on the dining table. That sloshing sound, I'll never forget it. That terrible splashing and the noise its weird legs made coming into contact with the linoleum floor. The sound of metal-tipped canes tapped on wood. And then, somehow, I sensed its objective. It was moving towards the fish tank. It's here for the fish, I mumbled over and over again. Its eyes, it's here for the fish. But then, a further thought occurred. Perhaps it would come for me after collecting its eyes. Maybe it needed those eyes in order to capture me. I had exposed it, quite literally, and I still felt that bizarre sense of disapproval in its presence. It wanted to remain hidden. And that, Doctor, is why I jumped out of the window. I couldn't bear it. I had absolutely no desire to wait for it to come after me. I landed on the grass in front of Mrs. Cockrell's kitchen window. Fortunately, she was washing the dishes at the time. I broke both of my ankles. It was the topsoil that saved me, I'm told, but I don't remember too much about that. The fall knocked me clean out. Thank God for small mercies, eh? If that fishbowl fella was coming for me, I sure as hell didn't want to know about it. But as of yet, he hasn't come for me. That's why I destroyed the photographs to make amends. He's no reason to come after me if I've burned all the evidence of his existence, right? Pity no one believes me. No matter though, I got my vindication after leaving the hospital. An odd stain by the window where my blue friend spilled some of his mind, and a few flakes of navy paint spread about the place by pointed feet. So, what do you think, Doctor? Am I completely mad? I wouldn't use that term, Miss Hennessy. It hardly matters. You know how it is for me now. If I see even a hint of blue, partially obscured in a room or in, in a crowd, I swear it's the fishbowl man. He's got his eyes back now. He can see again. What if he's still after me? It's okay in here, though. Everything's blue. Brightly lit. He prefers not to reveal himself entirely. Sticks to the shadows. Peeps around corners. And the fish you bought? What happened to them? They disappeared, of course. Belonged to his head, remember? Doubtful. The fishbowl man is a figment of your imagination. Can't you see that? I don't believe it for a second. Not for a sec. What in the name? Ah. Participant B, Miss Lila Hennessy. Deceased. Drowned, in fact. Somehow she drowned in her cell. I can't believe this. More tomorrow. Overseer's Log, October 27th, 1976. Dr. Stefan Helm here. I'm upset, but I'm not deterred. Project Dilution continues today, with the odd case of Mr. Morris. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, or so they say. Morris, on the other hand, has been known to consume up to 12 apples a day, sometimes more. This odd compulsion, owing, it is suggested, to a lack of nutrition in his youth, has resulted in yet another curious delusion. Morris 
the participant C has been assigned to the green room. Rather befitting an individual with a proclivity for Granny Smiths. Hello, Mr. Morris. Can you hear me clearly? Affirmative, Doctor. Uh, can I get some light in here? Oh, yes. My apologies. Yikes. Oh, thanks. Now then, describe your surroundings, please. I, I'm in a green room. The walls are green. The tiles on the floor are green. Even the sink and toilet are green. Can you describe the shade of green? It's a leafy green, the colour of a British summer. I don't want to say it, but I will anyway. It's an apple green. <laughs> Intentional. Do not trouble yourself with such matters at this stage, Mr. Morris. Instead, tell me your story. I'm eager to hear what happened to that arm of yours. Well, what can I say? I've always had a fondness for apples. Always. Apple pie, poached apples, apple muffins, you name it. I grew up in the city centre and never left. Not even on day trips with school. Was uh, 19 by the time I saw my first apple tree. <laughs> Bramley, you know. <laughs> I was captivated by it. But my favourite apple always has been the Granny Smith. <laughs> so green, so shiny. So sweet. My apple habit, if you want to give it a name, reached new heights last month in the Lake District. I get out of the city when I can. Hate it. Full stop. Unfortunately, I have, shall we say, trouble with open spaces. I'm fine cooped up in a cabin with a view, but not so much out in the wild. <laughs> Goes back to childhood, no doubt. Ah, I'm better off living the life of a drone, sentenced to a life of warehouse management. <laughs> uh, but that's by the by. So, I was up in the lakes, as I said, cooped up in a congenial cabin by Coniston Water, enjoying a view of the mountains and my own company. On the second evening, end of September this was, there came a gentle rapping at the cabin door. You see, I wasn't expecting any visitors, so it was with a great deal of hesitation that I went to the door. Uh, there was nobody there by the time I answered it, but, but on the decking outside was a wicker basket filled to the brim with, you guessed it, Granny Smith apples. What do you do? Uh, there was a note attached which read, Sample our delicious Granny Smiths, and in smaller print beneath, Remember to pace yourself. Although... A little strange. I figured that the apples had been dropped off by the owner of the cabin as some sort of welcome gift. The likelihood was slim, but I couldn't come up with any other explanation at the time. So, I took the basket inside, sat by the open fire, and tasted one of the apples. Doctor, it was divine, fabulously sweet, striking that perfect balance between crisp and tart, just how I like them. <laughs> and I couldn't eat just one either. Throwing caution to the wind and completely discounting the note's pace yourself warning, I ate a second and a third, one after the other. I mean, I didn't think it was too outrageous. A day isn't a day for Alan Morris if he hasn't eaten at least half a dozen apples. <laughs> Well, I washed the fourth one down with a cup of tea and sat back in the big chair by the fire, thoroughly pleased with the day's good fortune. I drifted off shortly afterwards. When I awoke, it was dark outside, and I could hear the first drops of rain striking the trees overhead. I gathered my faculties and made myself another cup of tea. Though I'm not a fan of being caught out in a thunderstorm, I'm a sucker for the light show if I'm safely indoors with a view. Yes. Soon enough, the rain was coming down in buckets. High above the cabin, the mountains appeared little more than dark, sinister shapes, and Coniston water below resembled a vast, murky pool, sporadically illuminated by flashes of lightning. It was a beautiful, 
if a little eerie, sight to behold. And, of course, in celebration of the event, I grabbed myself another Granny Smith from the wicker basket and chomped on it keenly. It was then that I first heard the voice. It was a small, high-pitched voice coming from somewhere above me. At least, that's how I perceived it to begin with. It whispered, "'One more will do it, matey, just one more.' I heard the voice over and over again, repeating the same words. Above the din of the showers and the clap of the thunder, I heard it droning. I tried to work out precisely where it was coming from, but wherever I wandered in the cabin, it was right there, right above me, whispering, "'One more will do it. Come on, matey, just one more.' I knew for sure that it was referring to the apples, knew that it wanted me to tuck into my sixth Granny Smith. Why was that? What was so significant about eating half a dozen as opposed to five? Now, it's fair to admit, Doctor, that I've heard voices before. I know that they're in my head, and I know that I shouldn't take any notice. It was the voices that talked me into pushing Eric James into the canal the voices that instructed me to punch Philip McMinn in the face, the voices that have all but convinced me that the great outdoors are unsafe, that I'm better off in the city, surrounded by the smog and the unfriendly faces. But this voice, Doctor, this voice wasn't in my head. It was just above it, floating in the air, following me around the cabin, like a ventriloquist targeting me from the shadows. One more will do it, it kept on in that same immutable tone of voice. Just one more. So I gave in, Doctor. Just gave in. Above the roar of the thunder, I yelled, OK, OK, anything to shut you up. And as I approached the wicker basket by the fire, the voice did indeed stop its incessant chirruping. I grabbed one of the shiny apples, held it up before my eyes, and stared at it. What was I hoping to discover by studying it? The answer to some mysterious riddle? A reason as to why a disembodied voice was pestering me? I don't know, Doctor. I've never been too good at dealing with such things. I get... confused. I'm easily goaded, you see. William Yates, with very little effort, persuaded me to draw rude words on the blackboard. Madison Sharple said it would work out just fine if I tripped Mrs. Cox as she walked into the classroom. And Nigella Hay swore that I'd feel better after drinking that cold tea. Cold tea that turned out to be puddle water. (laughs) Anyway, I I tucked into the sixth Granny Smith and devoured the whole thing, seeds and all. In a matter of seconds, a loud clap of thunder sounded, and I heard that shrill voice again. But this time, it sounded uh, muted, uh, sort of like it was speaking from within the confines of a cardboard box. It said, good, good, that'll do it, matey. And then I realized that the voice was emanating from the confines of something, It was emanating from the confines of my body. I felt it as much as I heard it. An unmistakable series of vibrations moving through my blood and bones. I I wondered then who it was that had delivered the apple. Why they had been delivered. And if that person had been out to get me in some way or other, why the warning? Remember to pace yourself, the note had read. And then the cramps, the crippling cramps. I fell to the floor, convulsing in pain. And with every agonizing second that passed, the storm without increased in ferocity. What have you done to me? I yelled, nobody in particular. What have you done? But but I heard the shrill voice no more. Its source was inside me now and I could feel it stretching its tendrils out into my extremities. 
nightmarish wisps reaching into my fingertips and toes. Whatever it was, it was trying to take me over, Doctor. Right then, I was overwhelmed by a sharp pain in the index finger of my left hand. I glanced down and saw that something had popped out of the end of it. Something dark and twig-like, sprouting with the rapidity of a blade of grass observed in a time-lapse video. I panicked, Doctor. Just panicked. With a great deal of effort, I climbed to my feet and raced to the kitchen in search of a blade. I found the meat cleaver immediately. I stretched out my monstrous arm, lifted the cleaver in the air, and, with all the force I could muster, brought it down on my elbow joint. It took a few swings, Doctor, because it wasn't just flesh and bone I had to hack through. I had to hack through that stick, too, that branch that presumably had its roots somewhere in my chest. Oh, uh, uh, I don't remember much after that. I blacked out. The owner of the cabin found me, and I have the storm to thank for that. A telegraph pole was struck by lightning outside. The thing collapsed and took out the front door. Serendipity, don't you think? Woke up in hospital the following day, groggy and missing my left arm at the elbow. No sign of the twig, though. Nothing unusual reported by the doctors, either. But I tell you now, I swear to you now, that I still hear that voice sometimes. One more will do it, matey, it says. Just one more. I think I weakened it somehow when I hacked my arm off. Put the fear of God into it. I mean, it wouldn't want me to go kill myself, would it? What would it do then? I reckon it thinks that it might be able to get the better of me again if I fill my belly with a few more of those seeds. Seeds from those Granny Smiths, the origin of which I still to this day am none the wiser about. Well, what do you think, Doctor? Uh, delusion? Could it be that simple? Your story is certainly an interesting one, Mr. Modis. But I am convinced without a shadow of a doubt that your inner demon is a delusion. Such things simply cannot be. What moral do it? What? What did you say? See? You heard it, didn't you? You did, didn't you? I heard you whisper something under your breath, Mr. Morris. That wasn't me, Doctor. That was it! It! That was... Me, matey. Only me. There is just no possible way that this... Mr. Morris is gone. Disappeared. Managed to escape somehow. I'm at a loss to explain it. Nor can I explain the presence of foliage in his cell. Crisp green leaves and apple seeds. This is getting ridiculous. Helm out. Overseer's Log, October 28, 1976. Dr. Stefan Helm speaking. Despite several failures, I remain committed to Project Delusion. Thus, I present participant D, a retired professor by the name of Conrad Derrickson. Derrickson has lived a long and fruitful life a life of scientific research pertaining to somnology, the study of sleep. Latterly, though, that crippling claustrophobia has robbed the man of his ability to work. Professor Derrickson, 
Can you hear my voice? Yes. Please, if you will. Describe the room in which you're sitting. It's an illusion, I know it is. But I'm pleased to say that I'm enclosed by spacious white walls, giving one the impression of a vast, open space. It isn't in the least profligate, Dr. Helm. I'm very grateful. Good. This is good. Now then, Professor, perhaps you could relate to me the circumstances surrounding your present predicament. Are you familiar with the hypnagogic state, Dr. Helm? Sam Vogt. Please elaborate. I like to refer to it as the plane between consciousness and unconsciousness, a space in which one is neither fully awake nor fully asleep, a transitional state, if you will. After years dedicated to the study of sleep disorders, apnea, paralysis, and so forth, I began to see evidence in my investigations to suggest that such disorders were largely influenced by one's passage through the hypnagogic state. That is to say, that in certain studies, I observed that some individuals tended to linger longer than others in the transitional space. What was the reason for this, I pondered. Unable to identify the cause of this unusual tendency, I decided that I myself was likely the only guinea pig capable of providing the answers I sought. And so, last winter, I began a series of experiments with a singular objective, to achieve conscious awareness of, and therefore, obtain boundless access to, the hypnagogic state. Yes, yes, I realize the contradiction in terms, but this was an experiment beyond mere words, Doctor. I went through a number of phases in pursuit of my goal. The first was the drug phase, in which I experimented with a number of psychoactive agents, the usual suspects, LSD, DMT, you name it, and found that the mind-altering nature of the drugs in question only served to impede my attempts to access the required state. The second phase was one of meditation, spiritual, mantra, transcendental, all of which, just like the previous phase, proved ineffective. The third phase, obvious and overlooked in the first instance, was a bit of the old sleep deprivation. I found that, in depriving myself of sleep for extended periods of time, I could, in small measures, alter my perception of the environment. To give you an example, at home, in the library, I could single out a book on the shelves and focus on it acutely until it changed colour or disappeared entirely. Leather-bound tomes turned yellow before my eyes. Dusty paperbacks vanished into thin air. A terribly unhealthy way to attain a goal, but I felt it was worth it. But was I, in fact, attaining a goal? Were these illusions actually the product of me having attained boundless access to the hypnagogic state? Or were they merely the result of my body and mind crying out for help? Regardless, I continued with my experiment. I slept two to three hours a night, forced myself out of bed in the early hours, and paced about my library in a continual effort to stay awake. The strangeness began in early spring of this year. My commitment to the experiment had lapsed on a number of occasions. Duty called at the lab, and one needs an income if one is to continue to live and prosper. My colleagues and I were studying the unusual case of a small boy, an insomniac who, much to his mother's chagrin, slept only a couple of hours a night, spending most of his waking hours staring at pictures on the walls. I immediately felt a kinship with this boy. David was his name, seven years old. Just as I had been able to do, David claimed that he had the ability, when he was, as he put it, very, very tired, to change things. And by this, he was referring specifically to the paintings hanging on the walls of his home. If he looked long enough at a portrait, he said, he could talk with its subject. If it were a landscape, he continued, he'd send the clouds in and make it rain. This doctor was all very fascinating to me. Formerly, I'd have said that the boy was hallucinating, very common in cases of insomnia, very common indeed. But having experienced it myself, I wasn't willing to believe it. Perhaps, I considered, 
Hallucination was merely boundless access to the hypnagogic state. In any case, conversations with David spurred me on, and I was eager to get back to it. My first success took place on April the 2nd. I can't recall the time precisely, but it was after midnight, and I'd been awake for some thirty hours or so. My attention had been focused on a door, just an ordinary door separating the dining room and the library. Occupying the space I believed was the transitional, I somehow managed to convince myself that the door was no longer there. The handle had been the first thing to fade away, followed by the door and hinges, and finally, the frame. I reached out in quest of it, but found only a hollow-sounding partition, neatly wallpapered, like the door had never been there at all. This disturbed me, Doctor. Disturbed me, because I was unable to reverse the process. I blinked and shook my head ferociously, paced around the room with my eyes closed, willed it to rematerialize. But still, the door refused to return from oblivion. Eventually, I settled down at the dining table and nodded off. When I awoke, the door was back in situ, but I felt incredibly groggy, tired in a way I'd never before experienced, almost as though a hidden part of my brain had been exercised for the very first time. Naturally, the experiment continued. Unlike the boy, David, I seemed to lack the imagination to converse with the occupants of portraits or to make clouds appear in the empty skies of landscapes. My abilities were limited to the alteration of a room's aesthetic, changing the colors of items, making doors and windows disappear. You've probably guessed what happened next, Doctor. I was sitting in the library, early May this was, manipulating the environment at will. I changed the colors of a dozen books, relegated a dozen more to the void, and had turned my attention to the doors either side of me, one leading back into the dining room, the other to the kitchen. I was rather lucid, I recall, and felt determined to get rid of those doors for some reason or other. At last, I achieved my goal, and found myself sitting in a room from which there was no exit. It was comforting at first. I felt untouchable, an invincible, eccentric professor who had managed to obtain boundless access to the hypnagogic state, locked away in a library out of time and space, enjoying his success privately. But before long, I became aware of a disconcerting lack of air, a closeness from which there was no relief. I grew hotter and hotter. My clothes clung to my skin. The sweat soaked them through. I gasped for air. My heart rate increased, and I began to doubt the reality of my situation. Was this the hypnagogic state I occupied, or was it merely a delusion born of sleep deprivation? Had I really achieved greatness, or had I, in fact, completely lost my marbles? The unreality of the situation robbed me of my faculties. I paced about like a madman, searching for the doors I'd so recklessly sent to Coventry like a pair of naughty children. But there were only books, row after row of strange volumes, books that didn't belong to me, that weren't a part of my collection, volumes conjured out of thin air to fill the voids that once belonged to navigable portals. I was a lunatic in a doorless cell. The heat was overwhelming. In the end, I must have collapsed, for when I awoke several hours later, I was lying on the cold parquet floor, shivering. Much to my relief, the library had returned to its normal state. I was very pleased to see both the door to the dining room and the door to the kitchen in their usual places. But I was stricken with a new fear. Claustrophobia. I couldn't bear to be in that room another second. I fled through the kitchen into the yard, looking up at the grey sky of dawn, thankful for the sense of open space it was providing. And there it is, Doctor. My unusual experience. 
Suffice it to say that I have spent very little time in the library, or any other small confined space, since that terrifying evening in May. Hypnagogic state or hallucination are the two one and the same. If you, Professor Derrickson, are unable to answer that question, then what makes you believe I might be qualified to? That's the reason I'm here, is it not? It is my belief that your inability to answer that question today is not due to a lack of knowledge, but owing to a reluctance on your part to accept the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter? Yes. Just look around you. What do you see? I've already described my surroundings, Doctor. Yes. And there's nothing to be afraid of in there, is there? Wait. The door. Where's the door? The door? Uh, I can't see it. Uh, I can't see it. Now, now, Professor Derrickson. Of course you can see it. Where is it? What are you doing to me? <laughs> oh, for the love of God. Participant D. Deceased. I... I... I don't want to talk about it. Overseer's Log, October 29th, 1976. This is Dr. Stefan Helm. Today, the final participant to subject herself to Project Delusion is a young lady known only as Lisa. For reasons yet to be determined, she chooses to remain anonymous, sharing her story under the proviso that a fair effort is made in ridding her of what she describes as a perpetual state of gloom owing to an odd case of personality division. Lisa, can you hear me? Yes. And can you describe for me your surroundings? Darkness. Just darkness. Thank you. And you feel comfortable with the lights out? I feel very little, Doctor. Can we just get on with it? Very well. Please, tell me how it all began. I wasn't always Lisa. I was Melissa before. That's M-E-L-L-I-S-A. I was happy, content. But then something happened to Melissa. She suffered a great loss. A close family friend, it was. Someone who'd always been there for her. Died at the hands of a violent husband. He took her from Melissa. Brought her face to face with her own mortality. She didn't like it. She couldn't take it. She crumbled. And in the process, Melissa split into two. Mel and Lisa. Mel was the light, the smiler, the talker, the life and soul of the party. Every cliché in the book. Lisa was the darkness, the introvert, the shadow. Something just ticking over in the background, unworthy of the spotlight. And, as dictated by her condition, Lisa sank deeper and deeper into the quicksand. For a while I met with Mel in my dreams, periods of time in which we slipped into that strange unconscious fantasy, met with Mel on those great featureless plains, and pondered together the possibility 
that one day we might reunite. That Mel wasn't whole without Lisa. Lisa without Mel. Mel stood in the rays of a thousand suns, beautiful and bold, whereas I, the recluse, hid among the creeping clouds of doom and despair. But our meetings dwindled, and when we did come together in the emptiness, we found that we were becoming further separated by a great rift, a tear in the bland earth beneath us, the purpose of which was seemingly to enforce our division. With every visit to the dreamscape, the rift grew wider and wider. I imagine I disappeared from view long before Mel. She aglow in the blaze of the suns, I in shadow, drowning in clouds. And so it was that Mel and Lisa were permanently separated. The darkness consumed me utterly. I sank into a deep despondency, longed for my other half, longed to be reunited in the measureless emptiness. Then I realized that I was that measureless emptiness, my feet caught in a bottomless quagmire. The light that had been Mel had gone out, and it was impossible to rekindle. And so... I have come to you, Doctor, desperate for you to reunite me with my other half. Can it be done? I'd like to believe so, Lisa. Mel, after all, is still alive and well inside your head. You understand that, don't you? I understand that you believe that to be so, Doctor. But I can assure you, Mel is as distant to me as the stars. Let me remind you, we're separated by an incalculable gulf. A gulf that exists within your mind, Lisa. Be that as it may, Doctor. The space between the two of us is immense beyond reckoning. Tell me, how is one supposed to calculate the expanses that separate thoughts? Mel and I are as thoughts now. Memories floating in the ether. Look about you. Describe the darkness for me. It's much like the measureless emptiness, Doctor. Both vast and tiny. Is it truly possible to describe the essence of darkness? It's a pure darkness, is it not? A darkness uninterrupted by starlight. Uninterrupted by creeping clouds and boundless rifts. A realm incapable of separating you from your other half. Let us locate Mel in the darkness, Lisa. Let us find her. Those suns, those countless stars soon to be revealed, will illuminate her. Yes, I think I can do it. I'm searching, Doctor. My eyes are wide. Already, I think I can see it. The light? Yes, the light from a thousand suns. It's cascading now, falling from the emptiness. And there's someone out there, faintly illuminated by the light. It's a person. It's... Who is it, Lisa? What can you see? It... it isn't Mel. I know that for sure. They're coming towards me now. It's a woman... But it isn't Mel. It isn't my other half. She's holding something. It's glimmering in the light. What is it? Describe it for me. I think it's a blade, Doctor. The woman is holding a knife. She's large, broad. I can see the expression on her face now. And it's one of hatred. Pure hatred. And it's aimed at me, Doctor. It's aimed at me. What's happening? Who is she? Do you know her? She's raising the knife. I think she wants to kill me. And there's nowhere to run. Nowhere to hide out here. Okay. Okay. 
Close your eyes. It's just an illusion, Lisa. Your delusion. No! Stay away from me. Stop it. Lisa! No! No! Stop! Lisa! <laughs> Mummy? Mummy? Help me clean this up, you little shit! No! I have a. I won't. I won't. I, I won't do it. No. Help me clean this up, you little shit. Psychiatrist's Log, October 31st, 1976. This is Dr. Alicia Ramsey of the Durham Institute. I'm directly responsible for the care and treatment of patient 202, Mr. Craig Michael Jeffries. It is with a great sense of pride and relief that I'm able to confirm that the Halloween experiment has been a resounding success. A little background. Jeffrey's unique case of multiple personality disorder has been the subject of much debate here at the Institute. As a child of seven, Mr. Jeffreys witnessed the violent death of his father, Mr. Roger Jeffreys, at the hands of his mother, Mrs. Matilda Jeffreys. The former was stabbed to death by the latter. Seven-year-old Craig was forced to assist his mother in disposing of his father's body. His condition is a direct result of this childhood trauma. The six distinct personalities, as recorded here by Jeffreys, Helm, Finkel, Hennessy, Morris, Derrickson and Lisa, have been with him for a very long time, each of them coming to the fore when appropriately stimulated, in this case via exposure to certain colours. Helm, however, seems immune to this effect, the Doctor has always been the dominant personality, a character capable of manipulating the other five. And so to the experiment. Under the watchful eye of myself and Doctors Matthew Fisher and Sally Reynolds, Jeffreys was provided with the means to act out a scenario, a scenario designed to expose and eliminate his multiple personalities, systematically curing the young man of his MPD. We observed the following curious particulars as the experiment unfolded. Finkel's account in the Red Room stemmed from Geoffrey's memory of the blood-stained carpet surrounding his father's body following his stabbing. Hennessy's account in the Blue Room referenced the colour and condition of the dilapidated conservatory into which the body of Geoffrey Sr. had been temporarily housed, not to mention the Fishbowl Man, undoubtedly a reference to the fishbowl that was shattered by his father as he defended himself. Morris's account in the green room was surely linked to the basement with its green tiled floor, the barrels of apples, the fruit cellar, where Jeffreys was locked up as a punishment for protesting. Derrickson's account in the white room was a representation of Jeffreys's emotional state, trapped in the white brick house on Park Road with no way out and Lisa's account in the black room embodied the subsequent horrifying weeks of isolation with Jeffreys confined to a dark and gloomy shed in the back garden, the very shed below which rested the body of Geoffrey Sr. It should also be noted that in at least two of the accounts, Jeffreys referenced an injury to his left index finger as sustained during the disposal of his father's body. To conclude, the strange stories told by each of Jeffrey's personalities resulting in death or departure allowed the young man to achieve catharsis. The process of telling their stories in what he believed to be a controlled environment effectively 
eliminated them. In the imagined darkness of the black room, Jeffreys conjured up an image of his mother, his mother out to kill his father. It's curious to note that it was this terrifying image of his mother that finally usurped Helm, the eccentric doctor, whose goal, like ours, had been to eliminate the delusions of his patients. It has been 48 hours since Jeffreys came back to himself. He looks and sounds like a different person. He'll be prepped and prepared for release in a day or two, following a thorough psychological examination. Regular checkups will of course be necessary in the months and years to come. His unique psychology is of great interest to the scientific community. I shall provide a written report forthwith, prior to the commencement of the Forks experiment, which, I have to say, owing to this week's successes, can only yield positive results. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.